All right, <clears throat> so welcome. This is the first lecture of Physics 252 for the summer. Um, we are going to do the lectures this way. I'm going to present the, contact in one, the content in one video, maybe two, uh, possibly sometimes three uh, videos per chapter, and then there will be a separate video for a homework help problem. So, um, the you know the the first video the content video will just be me presenting the material in the form usually of powerpoints uh sometimes you know i do work on the on the board behind me but um if you have you know if you have questions with the content itself you can address that video if you have you know questions about okay i've got a homework problem that's for a separate video all right uh we are going to begin with uh, electrostatic. So um, I posted videos or links rather to YouTube videos. I hope you watch them. These, those are phenomena: the Richard Hammond getting struck by lightning in a car, and those uh, lords of lightning, right? Those guys in their um, conductive metal suits. I like to start with uh, each chapter and topic with things that we want to understand. Like, why is it? uh that richard hammond was safe why are those guys okay i mean you know eight hundred thousand volts with plenty of current uh we'll see that the voltage by itself will of course define what voltage is in this class uh but we'll see that voltage by itself is not what kills you it's a voltage the combination of voltage and current um and that's a lot of current so he would definitely be toast and those guys in their suits uh if those conduct if those metal suits were not conductive and closed, um, topologically closed, uh, is something we'll discuss, then they would be toast as well. They would not be pretty. So uh, that's one of the things that we want to understand. Why, why is it that if you're in a conductive cage, um, and you know, why is it that if you're in a conductive cage, sometimes called a Faraday cage, are you safe from harm uh, if you're struck by lightning or by struck by anything uh, electrical, any enormous source of electricity. Um, for videos, if, if you're, this is your first chance to upload a video, uh, again, like I said in the orientation video, if you want to interact with the course, right, interact for the attendance's purposes, you can go, hey, uh, I think I can find a video of someone or something getting struck by lightning in a Faraday cage. Uh, that's sufficiently different from what Mr. Carr linked to. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up, you know, if I can't um, interact with the course in seven days. So that's one one option for um, it's one option for attendance. Okay, so that's things like that are what we want to try to understand. Uh, electrostatics is the study of electricity in equilibrium, but that doesn't mean it's one equilibrium necessarily. It can be moving from one equilibrium to the next equilibrium to the next. Um, electrodynamics is the study of electricity, electric charge in constant continuous state of motion. Electrostatics is the study of electric charge in equilibrium, uh, and it could be you know a set or a series of equilibria. Okay. Um, Topics that we're going to cover in this lecture, or in this unit rather, um, like I said, I might cut this lecture off and split it in two. Uh, static electricity, again, static just means in equilibrium. Uh, conservation of charge, the idea that charge is neither created, uh, the total amount of charge in a closed system uh, is neither created nor destroyed, it's just transferred. Uh, we'll look at electric charges in an atom. Uh, that's kind of basic stuff. We'll define insulators and conductors. Uh, we will talk about uh, charge induction, how to induce charge and using an electroscope to measure that. We'll then, of course, define how to measure the actual quantity of force between two charges. Uh, the model for that, our understanding for that is Coulomb's law. And then that's probably where I'll cut this first lecture off. Uh, the topic of electric field, um, field lines, all that stuff will probably come in the second lecture. Okay, so um, playing around with charge, right? Our first 
exploration of charge as human beings is often to observe static electricity, that things stick to you through static electricity, or if, let's say, you shuffle your feet on a carpet and then touch the metal doorknob, you get zapped. Um, but in this case, let's look at, okay, if I uh, have this cloth here, um, generally cloths, uh, wool in particular, collect dust. Dust itself then tends to collect stray electrons and therefore becomes statically charged. And then you can rub this ruler with that cloth and transfer by contact uh, conduction, uh, transfer some of those free electrons to the, the ruler. The ruler being an insulator is not going to allow those free electrons to move around very easily. And so they're going to stay put. it will be a charged object. And then somehow that charged object picks up pieces of paper. Now, our assumption here is that the pieces of paper start off neutral. So how can a charged object pick up neutral pieces of paper? That's one of the questions we are going to answer. Okay. Uh, to start with, um, the, basic, the basic, basic principle of electric charge is that it comes in two forms or two charges, right? Positive. We label them positive and negative. Uh, now, the universe doesn't have to be that way. There could be three charges. There could be five charges. Uh, in the world of the nuclear strong force, there are actually three charges. Um, so it's kind of an interesting physics question. Why are there just positive and negative? Why are there two charges? Okay, that's a very deep question um, that physicists seek to answer. We kind of have a good handle on that, but it's a little bit beyond the scope of our course. So uh, generally, in an in-class a seated lecture, I'd probably go off on a bit of a tangent, but um, <laughs> let's stay focused here. Got a video to make. Um, okay, so, right, like charges repel each other, opposite charges attract. One of the things that we do want to understand is these things aren't actually touching each other, right? These two rods, uh, positively negative charge, aren't actually touching each other, so how can they uh, exert a force on each other? What's What's the deal? How can they, you know, reach out through space and push on each other without actually being in contact? Uh, that's a that's an actual mystery that, or a question that physicists ask that a fellow named Michael Faraday answered. So we'll talk about that. Um, in all the circumstances that we're going to study, electric charge is conserved, and in fact. Uh, in any closed system, the total electric charge will not change. You know, you can transfer charge in normal systems, conventional systems, charge is transferred in more exotic systems like particle collisions and accelerators, uh, particles are actually created. But even in that case, the total charge on a system in a system, a closed system, remains fixed. Okay. Um, Okay, so the electrostatic force is also important, of course, because it holds the atom together and it holds different atoms together. It holds matter together in terms of molecules, uh, the various kinds of um, chemical bonds are, of course, electrostatic bonds. Um, the electric force is what holds all of matter together. It's responsible for all of chemistry. Uh, this is a very crude, somewhat inaccurate picture of an atom, but it's in a recognizable model. Um, the, you know, electrons, of course, are bound to the nucleus by the electrostatic force. Uh, at this point, you should, you know, I, I kind of point out that uh, if you haven't heard, I'm not going to tell you yet, but it's someone at this point can say, well, then what's, what's holding the nucleus together? It's a bunch of positive charges, and you just told me that positive charges repel each other. And here's a bunch in the nucleus, there's a bunch of positive charges all smashed in together, all stuck together. Uh, how does that work exactly? I mean, what, you know, the, if you tell me the electric force between positive charges pushes each other apart, then there's got to be something a whole lot stronger uh, than the electric force going on in that nucleus. I wonder what that is. Well, we might get around to talking about that in this class. Uh, like I said, electrostatics underlies all of chemistry. It underlies the basic secret of life, <laughs> right? All of life comes down to water. Uh, water is a transport molecule. There's the reason why everything needs water, okay? If you ever wondered, uh, why is water so essential for life? 
uh, because transport of materials and nutrients. I mean, that's just how you know, living systems work. They got to transfer things around inside the, you know, the trunk or the leaf or the hand or the whatever, right? Um, things got to be transported and water's do, water does the job. It's a transport mo molecule. Why? Because it has, it's polar by its nature. It's got a negative side and a positive and two positive sides. Why does it have the negative side? Uh, negative end, it's in the oxygen. Well, the oxygen nucleus is more electronegative, right? More protons in the oxygen nucleus pull the shared electrons, you know, more towards the oxygen end, uh, leaving because the, you know, molecule as a whole is neutral. Uh, if you shift some of the electrons near the oxygen side, you're going to leave the hydrogen sides positive. And that polarity, right, that stable polarity of the water molecule, not only under, underlies its surface tension. Surface tension is just a, an explanation for why a word description for why water molecules stick to each other. Because obviously you've got negatives connected to positives, connected to negative, connected to positives in the chain. But it's also, you know, this polarity is why water is a transport molecule. Okay. Um, Let's define the difference between conductors and insulators. A conductor is where uh, charge flows freely, okay? How does that happen? I mean, again, you're looking at this and you're paying attention, you should think, well, but you just told me that the electrons are bound to the nucleus. How do they flow freely? Do they just go wandering off? What's going, and what's the deal? Um, well, in metals, there are outermost electrons called conduction band electrons. And the conduction band electrons, um, because they have a whole bunch of electrons inside, underneath them, between them and, and the nucleus. Right? These are the outermost electrons. Electrons come in shells. The outermost shell of electrons um, in, in many atoms um, is so weakly held, so weakly bound, that if you get a bunch of these atoms together, then all those you know, each atom's weakly bound outermost electron, or electrons in some cases, uh, just sort of flow around, right? They're kind of stuck very weakly to the mass of atoms, um, but because each atom's electrons are kind of shielding this outermost electron, uh, each atom therefore has one or more, we call them conduction band electrons, that can just wander around. Right, they're very loosely stuck to the material, uh, but they're, you know, not held in place to one particular atom, and so uh, very easy to push these things around. Uh, that's what conduction conductors are. They're materials where there is an abundant supply of conduction electrons, so loosely bound electrons. Okay, so in this picture, if you have like, um, if you have a charged object and a neutral object on the left-hand side, uh, you put a metal between them uh, because charges can flow freely through the bulk of the metal. And, and as we'll see, they actually end up flowing only on the surface. They could flow uh, through the bulk if we drove them, but they end up flowing by themselves if we leave them to flow only on the surface. And um, that that ability of a metal to conduct electrons from one object to another allows electrons to be pulled from the right uh, object or sphere onto the left object or sphere until there is equilibrium, right? They don't just keep going because obviously the left object becomes more negative, it's going to push back. So uh, e electrostatic equilibrium is achieved because this conductor allows electrons to flow from the right object to the left. Uh, wood doesn't happen with wood, obviously, because even though there's there's an imbalance of charge, uh, wood is a non-conductor. What is a non-conductor? It means all the electrons in the material are tightly bound, uh, which means if you try to push an electron through them through the material, it won't go. It won't, you know, cause this domino effect where you know you push it on and then it you know moves all the way through, um, or kind of a daisy chain. Each one pushes the next. Um, if electrons are tightly bound, then they stay put. And if they stay put, then the electrons can go through, which means uh, you can have these two electrostatically imbalanced objects um, in contact through an insulator. All right. Um, 
Conduction uh, involves contact. Conduction, contact, easy to remember. Uh, if you have a neutral metal rod conductor now, and you take a charged object, like a positively charged rod, uh, like there in the homework, there is, I just posted the two homeworks, by the way, in case you didn't notice, they're on mastering physics. Um, in the homework, there's an example of this, some practice problems that you can look at. Uh, electrons, uh, if I bring a positively charged metal rod and I make contact with the neutral metal rod, uh, electrons will be pulled off of the neutral metal rod because they're conducting, they can move easily until electrostatic equilibrium is reached, right? And there's a positive charge, a balance of positive charge. Now, the amount of positive charge isn't necessarily the same. It is, as we'll see, uh, something called the electric potential, otherwise known as voltage, that is the same. Um, but that's coming up. All we need to know is for now is that charge will, of course, move from the conducting neutral rod onto the um, positively charged rod. It will draw negative charges, electrons, until the positive charges uh, re reach electrostatic equilibrium. And again, that does not mean the amount, the quantity of charges is the same. It just means that the force on each charge, uh, the net force on each charge is zero. That's what equilibrium means, in case you didn't pick that up from physics one, uh, 251. So we can actually charge, believe it or not, we can charge an object without touching it uh, with, a, with another charged object. This is how that works. You start with the neutral metal rod. Uh, you in, induce separation, polarization. It's called induced polarization by bringing a positively charged rod near to but not touching the neutral metal rod. It separates the charge, pushes positives away. Um, actually, since the positive don't actually move, it pulls the negatives towards the positive. So you're separating them. And then if somehow you can get rid of or neutralize one end of this rod, uh, then you will leave that rod with a net charge, even though you haven't touched it. So how do we neutralize it? We connect it to ground. Okay, now ground is not technically touching it with the charged object. What is ground? Ground, uh, we use the word ground because the actual ground is like this. But the word in electrostatics, the word ground means an infinite reservoir of neutrality, right? Um, an infinite source or sink of charge so as to ensure that the object remains net neutral in general, okay? So what does that look like? It, look, it just means that if we have this uh, neutral rod connected to ground, those three lines mean ground, uh, we bring a negatively charged rod near it, it will push electrons into ground. Right? Electrons are the ones that move. Uh, so electrons on this thing are pushed away from electrons here. Um, on this rod, the negatively charged rod, the electrons leave. And then if you cut the connection to ground, you isolate this thing, well, it's lost electrons. They got pushed off. And so now it's acquired a net positive charge. Even though the only thing it has actually been in contact with is a neutral ground, it is now positively charged, okay? All right, um, so that's that's what goes on conductors. Non-conductors can be affected by charge, and this explains the aluminum rod, aluminum can and charge rod video, which you should watch. It's a practice um, problem on your homework, but you know, definitely need to watch that. I'm gonna be referring to it. Um, so non-conductors are affected by charged objects. Uh, just less so, in a similar fashion, but less so. So a non-conductor, right, these electrons, um, these, these circles represent the atoms, the neutral atoms, they start off neutral. And then the electrons are drawn towards the positively charged object, but they can't leave. They're, it's, this is a non-conductor, so they're tightly bound, uh, but they just sort of drift a little, right? They still feel the force, so they're sort of pulled, these negative charges, are pulled towards the positively charged rod, uh, therefore sort of uh, separating, in a sense, polarizing each atom, okay? So the total charge in each sort of gray circle here is still zero, but the charge is kind of separated. Now, of course, if you have uh, negative charges that are just a little bit, right, little bit closer to these positive charges in the rod, you're gonna have an attractive force. It's gonna be very weak, but it will still be there, an attractive force.
Okay, that's how, for example, imagine uh, you've got a charged balloon, right? Uh, you rub a, you charge a balloon, and then you stick it to your shirt. How do, how does the balloon, which has the charge, the rubber is non-conductor, so it like the charge gets stuck to it. But you can then take the charged balloon and stick it to anything, right? Wall, shirt, <laughs> okay? How does that work? Well, the charged balloon is like this charge rod, and then the wall, like the non-conductor, uh, there's this polar induced polarization that occurs, and then a, a weak attractive force, okay? Um, I haven't posted one yet. It's going to be late. We're already one day behind schedule. That's life. We'll deal with it. We'll probably try to get caught up as soon as we can. But um, I've got an electroscope lab where we qualitatively assess the uh, the presence of static electric charge and the behavior of static electric charge uh, in a device like this. It looks like, a little bit like this. Ours are more modern. But uh, you've got this um, metal ball connected with a conducting metal rod or post to two gold leaves, which are also conducting gold is the second best, uh, the second best elemental conductor. If I deposit positive charge on this metal sphere, it's free to migrate down onto the leaves. But since the same charge is migrating to both of the leaves, uh, the leaves are like charge and they repel each other. So when the leaves repel, uh, that indicates the presence of charge. And the amount by which the leaves repel indicate the amount of charge. Again, it's a qualitative assessment. You can't um, take a, make a quantitative assessment uh, with a device like this. So, for example, right, you take some positive charge. Uh, you can induce, so the electroscope starts off neutral. You induce uh, polarization in the electroscope um, where the positively charged object draws electrons up off the leaves. The leaves then each have a positive charge and repel each other. If you then make contact, so that's induction on the left. Conduction, you're making contact, uh, you're actually pulling electrons off of, rather than just pushing them up towards the top of the sphere, you're pulling electrons off of the object into the rod. Uh, the, and then if you take the rod away, the uh, deflection in the right-hand case will persist, it's permanent. In the left-hand case, temporary induction, you take, because you haven't made contact, if you take that part, uh, charged rod away, the electroscope will go back to neutral and the deflection will um, disappear. Okay, um, we can determine the sign of an unknown charge if we already know the charge on electroscope. Let's say we charge it up with some negative charge, the leaves are negative. Uh, if we take another negatively charged object and bring it close to but not touching, right, this is induction, the electroscope, well, it's going to push even more electrons down onto the leaves and the deflection will become even greater. If, however, we bring a positively charged object near to the electroscope, it will pull up, draw negative charges up off the leaves towards the sphere, and then the deflection of the leaves, because they lost their uh, sum of, of their charge, the deflection will decrease. Okay, so Coulomb's law. Um, the we've got you know everything that we've talked about so far is qualitative, right? Um, the Behavior of charge can be assessed qualitative, qualitatively with an electroscope. The amount of charge can be assessed qualitatively, but not good enough, obviously. We need to be able to predict exactly the force in newtons between any two charge objects. And that's what uh, Coulomb's law is all about. Okay, Coulomb's law says, uh, at first it was empirical, and then we kind of got a theoretical handle on this, but it says that the force, let's go back here and just read it, and then we'll look at the equation the force between two charges is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the distance between them, to the square of the distance between them, more precisely. So looks like this, um, right? K is some constant. We'll define that in a second. The force between two charges, the magnitude of the force between two charges is some constant K times the magnitude of each charge divided by the square of the distance between them. R is the distance between the two charges. And this is a magnitude. Force is a vector, uh, but of course the direction of the force vector is either toward between, towards each charge towards each other or on each charge away from each other. Right? We already sort of figured that out, right? So uh, the direction comes from the sign, comes from assessing the sign. Uh, the magnitude comes from that equation, okay? 
Um, so you can have repulsive forces even though you've got two positive charges. You can have repulsive forces even though you have two negative charges. So keep in mind, when you use this equation, it's a magnitude. You cannot, this equation cannot be negative, okay? When you put in the, mag, the Q1 and Q2, those are magnitudes so that you get a magnitude of force. And then uh, you choose a coordinate system relative to your coordinate system, the resulting force uh, based on the sign of the charges will either have a positive or negative sign relative to your coordinate system, okay? Do not let this equation determine the sign, positive or negative, of your force. It's a magnitude. Uh, Coulomb's constant, pretty big number, okay? I'm In my examples uh, and in the book, as well as in uh, the homework problems, if you use 9 times 10 to the 9th, it's easy to remember, right? 9 times 10 to the 9th, 2 9s. Um, you're going to get all the problems right, okay? <laughs> the actual value is differs from 9 times 10 to the 9th by a very small amount. So uh, I just use 9 times 10 to the 9th. That's a big number, okay? 10 to the 9th, that's a billion, right? 10 to the 6th is a million, 10 to the 9th is a billion. 9 billion newtons, uh, newton meters squared per coulomb squared. What does that mean? It means if I have one coulomb in my left hand and one coulomb in my right hand and my you know hands are about a meter apart, one, one, divided by one, okay? The only thing left in that equation is, is the constant K. One coulomb of charge in my left hand, one coulomb of charge in my right hand experiences nine billion newtons of force. Nine billion newtons of force, folks. That's like on the order of less than, somewhat less than two billion pounds of force, a lot of force, okay? The electrostatic force is extremely strong. Very strong forces uh, bind molecules together. That's why we get all this energy released when we have chemical reactions. Um, the amount of charges that we normally deal with uh, in electrostatic situations are on the orders of millionths of a coulomb, right? The micro one, micro coulomb is 10 to the negative sixth. One millionth of a coulomb. So you might be thinking, coulomb is a lot of charge then, right? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, like I said, static electricity doesn't really accumulate on the order of coulombs generally, because if it did, we'd have 9 billion newtons of force. Um, but in terms of moving charge, we move coulombs of charge around all the time. One coulomb of charge moving through a circuit per second is called an amp. One amp. And uh, your cell phone charger usually... Most cell phone chargers uh, run on anywhere between one and two amps. So one and two amps of charge, coulombs, moving through your cell phone charger per second. Now, why doesn't it rip it apart? Because positive charges go one way, negative charges go the other way. The whole system remains neutral. But my point is uh, one coulomb of charge uh, is something that we deal with all the time, just not in isolation. If we did, if we had one coulomb of charge in isolation, uh, it would... <laughs> it would have the equivalent force of an in immense detonation. It would just rip things apart. Okay. Um, qualified slide here. So charging the electron is a very small amount in terms of coulombs. 1 times 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. Again, sometimes if I'm, being, uh, if I'm doing an estimate, which ends up being pretty close, uh, I just use 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Okay. Very, very small. It's a lot of zeros before the, <laughs> if you convert this to coulombs, right? It's uh, 0.18 zeros and then 1602. So, uh, so yeah, that's, you know, that just happens to be a, a convenient unit of charge. Um, for most purposes, right? For, in the world of chemistry, for example, charge is quantized in units of the electron charge. Um, so for, Stable matter, okay, stable matter, all charge comes in units of electrons, right, electron units. So the proton is one unit of positive charge, and then the electron is one equal unit of negative charge. Why is this false uh, in general, though? I mean, it's true in stable matter. But in particle colliders, we can rip the actual proton apart. The proton is not a fundamental particle. The electron is, as far as we know, but the proton is a composite particle, okay? Uh, it's made of quarks, and each quark has a fraction 
of one unit of charge. So one, some quarks have one third, some other quarks have two thirds. Okay, so uh, you'll see you'll see in your book. Sorry, I got to silence my phone. Uh, you'll see in your book that um, the force Coulomb force is written this way. We're not going to talk about this quite yet. It's a it's just a different way of writing the constant, the force constant. Because, why is this important? Uh, you could ask, why is the force that strong? Where does that strength come from? Well, that's a deeper question, again, that relates to electric fields, and we're going to get to that. So um, this constant epsilon naught called the permittivity of free, free space, uh, I'll tell you now, it's just a measure of uh, how easily electric fields spread through space. And that doesn't make sense at first if we haven't talked about electric fields, but we'll get there. Okay, so uh, you need to be able to do the examples in the book. I'm not going to do the examples in the book for you. I might do some of the homework problems, but uh, in terms of conceptual examples, every example in the book, right, every single one is uh, solved for you. So I'm not going to do it because I don't need to because it's been already been done. Okay, so these examples you need to work through. I'm going to assume you can do this stuff. Uh, so take a look at the book. Just because I'm assuming that you can do it doesn't mean that if you have a question about it, uh, you can't ask me. I'm here. I'm your instructor. I'm happy to ask, answer questions. Uh, but you need to take a look at this first. Give it a try first. Um, and then if, you know, if looking at the actual solution still doesn't make sense, then let me know, okay? All right, so uh, your job is to do the examples, all these examples, okay, um, in the book for electrostatics. We're going to stop with electric field for this video, and then take a look, once you've done the examples, take a look at the homework problems, do uh, the homework problems. The last two problems are kind of challenging. Um, so give those a try first, and then I'll probably you know, record a video, a help video or a hint video for the last two problems. So again, I'm referring to homework chapter, the chapter 22 homework part one. All right, folks, uh, let me know whatever questions you've got, and I'll see you in the next video.